meaning is. Have you been able to figure it out for yourselves if I, as I'm speaking? Yes, it's a metaphor. You're right. My meaning that my poem has a literal meaning that you can see, but also a metaphorical meaning. It's not just a pretty picture in the air. What are you saying? It's a metaphor for frustration, anger, for my experiences growing up in a deaf school, for having my slangs taken away from me and being forced to use the oh, of course, you're right. <laughs> Um, having my signs taken away from me, being forbidden to sign, being forced to use um, oral methods of communication. You're saying that it's a metaphor for the fact that the world isn't perfect. And that it, you have to um, show that the world is not always perfect. Right. You're saying that when seeds spread, it seems it's a symbol for um, that seeds will always continue to live, that they'll continue to propagate no matter what. And that you cannot keep these hands clutched, they will open. Even if you don't plan it, even if you don't intend it, even if you try to rid the world of them, they still will continue to sprout. Exactly. That's right. So the sign continue is, is an appropriate one to use in the instance. In this person's opinion, um, it used to be that deaf people were allowed to use their sign language. And then the invention of oral methods of communication and education appeared and really diminished the ability for deaf people to use their hands to communicate. But now it's, it's beginning to spread again that people are free to use sign language to communicate. You're right. What we've been talking about is a metaphor, is, is examples of how this poem is a metaphor for really deeper feelings. It has a, so the poem has a deeper meaning than what you merely see when you first watch. Now, remember, I opened the poem with mowing, or telling you about how I was mowing the grass, and how I realized that this dandelion and I had something in common. I was before um, punished for signing. And I used this, and I used this sign to say, to experience, express my frustration at being oppressed in this way. And then again, I wasn't using that sign to talk about how I was trying to rid the dandelion. Now, back in 1980, at the, or, so 1880, the Milan Conference. Um, there was a Milan Conference that occurred, and it was a, a milestone in the history of deaf people. For at that conference, sign language was forbidden all around the world. Um, deaf teachers were fired, sign language was um, shunted off from the programs for the deaf. But now, again, sign language is continuing, is starting to be on the rise again. We'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> you think it's going to take off now? Well, I agree. I really agree. Okay, I'm going to repeat the poem now, so we'll have another chance. tree that's lived for a long time and it is old and weathered. Back in 1978, that was about when mainstreaming started. Am I right there in the 70s, 73? I don't know. At that time, what is that date? You're saying 1973? Okay, well, in the early 70s, mainstreaming began to become a widespread method of education. And I was working in a mainstream school for deaf 
our children, and I saw the kinds of frustrations that they went through, and I became very frustrated. I had many clashes with the teachers. Now, I was at that time commuting from Reno to Carson City. I lived in Reno, and I went to the um, school to work in Carson City. And it was about a 50-mile drive commute each, each way. And every day when I was driving, I saw this tree, and it really inspired me, and out of it came this poem. through freezing cold, through sleet, that tree remains. And even the, through drought, when it's dry, the trees still live. And as I watched that tree day after day after day, and thought about my own frustrations, I felt I was a kindred spirit to this tree. Now I'll repeat the poem. Um, 
actually did videotape it at that time, and I watched the videotape and tried to keep the same style in which it was conceived and perform it that way today, to keep the style of 72 alive. And you'll see that my poetry style has evolved since then. Windy Bright Morning is about this window where the shade is pulled down. And the wind is blowing through, letting in through the cracks the light of the morning. And as I'm sleeping, that light gets through my eyelids, as if the wind and the sun know that I'm deaf and that I need a flashing light in order to wake up. I just added that, um, letting you know that I felt as if the sun and the wind knew I was deaf. So I get up to close the window. You know how RIT buildings are constructed, right? You have to close the window as it swings out, pull it shut. And that's the way all those buildings are built. So I pulled it shut and went back to bed to try to sleep again. But my body was very warm. But all of a sudden, I felt that the window had gotten open again. And again, the sun was crashing into my bed. The wind had opened the window on its own, and the cold air was rushing in it. And I was startled and taken aback, and I got up and let up the shade a little bit and felt, hey, this isn't so bad. This is something I want to be awake to feel. And you know, here in Rochester, every day there tends to be clouds overhead. Rochester is famous, infamous for cloudy weather. And you'd be like, come on, sun. But all of a sudden, there was this one morning when the sun shone brightly, cold and clear. And I'll never forget it. He's asking me here, um, does this poem have a hidden meaning? Is it a metaphor for something? And no, I think this, meaning, this poem is really uh, more for the enjoyment, the beauty of the vision, and the feeling, the expression of my experience at that time. The next poem is entitled Snowflake. How can I talk about this? Let me see. A snowflake is a concept that at one point I took a real liking to. But I didn't know how to arrange it with that poem, so I held on to the idea for almost three years, mulling it over in the back of my mind. And then one day I met a deaf child. And I realized now that the snowflake had found its home in a poetry about the child. This is about the child with his father, who was very proud of the way that the child could speak. It's strange. When I made this match between the snowflake and the story of the child, I really didn't know why I put it together that way. I wrote my poem and conceived of it, and then realized that the hidden meaning was more than I, than I had been aware of when I created it. After I had performed the poem, I'll talk about that with you, okay? Have you discovered the metaphor in this poem? You don't see any. Oh, my goodness. He said he saw no hidden meaning, but there really is here. He 
just thinks about the boy and his grammar, and that he does, can't use ASL, but he has to use English, like someone who's assigned English, just an English word order, being forced to use those words. But for me, um, really I'm talking about the boy using the oral method of communication. I just added the sign so you could see what he was saying. <laughs> You're saying that your interpretation of it is that sign language is so wonderful, just like a snowflake is. That's an interesting interpretation. Very good. You're very warm. He's very close. He caught an important part that at the end, the snowflake is dissolved. You notice my face. Do I, I do not. I have a bit of a smile on my face. Very slight. You're very close. Your interpretation is very close. You are saying here that it's a feeling that the snowflake melting is about the feelings that are hidden inside of you. That you a person has to fake it in order to make it in this hearing world. You're saying this is about snowflake growing and that later it will be able to spread to the earth and rise again. Hmm, that's interesting. You're saying here that the meaning is that one's expression in some cases must be blank and hide one's anger not being able to express your true feelings. You're all very close here. You're saying that you couldn't really follow all of it, but at the very end, you caught the idea that the snowflake is obliterated into the ground, meaning that oppression is continuing, and the smile is just a cover-up for the hard feelings of that oppression. You're saying that the meaning is that the little girl, or little boy, whatever, right? I didn't specify the gender. You're right, that the meaning is about that the communication here is simply superficial. There's no depth to it. Right, very good. Okay. Yes? You're saying the poem here is about the feelings of bitterness and disappointment that one feels. When the snowflake is dissolved in the earth, there's a kind of a bitter feeling. Hmm. I think um, you're right. This poem is very ironic. <coughs> The snowflake ends and my expression is mild, but that mild expression really is ironic. The snowflake, you know, the snow, no two snowflakes are alike. Each snowflake has its own unique design. Each snowflake is an individual. Every snowflake is its own entity. And what could that equate to? What could that concept equate to? The snowflake is like each different person in the world, who is also unique, right, is poetic. The snowflake is a metaphor for the individuals, right. The snowflake, well first you see, we have the sun. The sun now is representative of warmth and energy, heat, and also of authority. Who's in authority? Father, right. The Father who's above and in authority, who has the power, and the heat of him radiating oh. down. Now the snowflake then is the metaphor for the child. And when he lands into the heat of the Father, what happens? He melts. Right. And this is symbolized a symbol of how he loses his identity. He's dissolved into the heat of his father's power. Now it looks very beautiful. My expression is that it's all very lovely, but ironically, it's very sad. So I'll do this poem again for you so you can see it again. <coughs> what else did I want to mention? Oh, oh, did you notice something? You were saying that you, when you said something about the deaf child, it really struck me. How did you know that the child was deaf? How did all of you know that? Because of the way they were trying to read lips and the, the way that they spoke and the way they said, my name is, that's right. Okay, I see how you caught that now. You're saying that the father is saying faith is, faith, yes. Huh, that's good. He's saying that, he's saying that I am five years, and the S is like an S. Old and that act can be the flip of the sun, meaning that in some way connected. Why did you know how it's
vision of them is the town that's small.
morning that one hands turned face up, it might mean the flag is there, face up, but the people still survive beyond the stars and stripes. Um, but the world itself is gone. The world of the flag is gone. You're saying that the face up flag symbolizes the people who have AIDS who are um, who are simple, who are honored in the quilt, the panels of the quilt. You're right. It's talking about the quilt. He's saying this is talking about the quilt. And what if the American flag was a part of that quilt? What would that be about? If the American flag was down there as a part, piece of the quilt, that means when the soldiers die in war, um, there's a parade. And they always put quilts, uh, when, when soldiers die, quilts are often placed over the, over the coffin. That's right. It's an interesting interpretation. Or the flag is placed over the coffin. But you're talking more about deaf people. Maybe, maybe deaf people who have AIDS have died. That's right. <coughs> this is really true, that this is a difficult poem to decipher. But it's important that when I sign the death, um, stars and stripes, as I do, this is a way of saying the deaf people. And when the, both these flags are overturned, it's a way of saying that the deaf population will diminish. The world will diminish. It may grow again. But at the time, it's diminishing because of, the, of AIDS. Deaf community is very small to begin with. It may be able to, um, people may say, oh, we can um, find a cure and, and people will survive AIDS after all. But if too many people in that community get it, then we might not be able to save that community. She's asking here, why are there two different flags? Well, because it's symbolizing both of my friends, John and Sam. who were involved in the performing arts. And one night, we were discussing something and having a nice time when all of a sudden, there was a really nasty fight between two of us. Um, the next day, it seemed that it had been resolved, but one person, the one of them who had been involved in the um, argument, came up to me and said later, you know, I told him I was sorry. And that really disturbed me. She was the one that said she was sorry. So I created this poem and I dedicated it to my friend who said, Sorry. 
like me to repeat it again, anyone? Shall I do it again? Okay. Okay, fine. Now, do you want me to explain anything more about it first, or, or not? Should I just go ahead and do it again? No, yes. I shall just go ahead and do it again. Okay, fine. Do you want me to talk about it? No. No, it's only people saying no. I just don't dare. I'll leave it up to you, and you can all decide for yourselves, and I'll call it home again. That's fine. After I perform it, we'll discuss it in depth, and then when I perform it for the second time, you'll understand much more clearly. Home, the cave. I created this poem because one woman named Barbara Canica was giving a presentation about deaf culture, and at that time it was 1985, and I sat there. There was one point that she made about cochlear implants. And she was talking about the inner ear. And you know how they always talk about the big ear. You know, they put this gigantic poster, the huge <laughs> ear, on the wall for everyone to look at. Yeah, you know, the poster that you've all seen over and over again. And I really like this idea of the big ear. <laughs> you know, that often has people see it as one big ear without even looking at it. That's just what we really are. Finally, um, it happened 
band. You're right. I'm kind of like a band. Except it's like music, you know, uh, like a big fanfare band. You're close. You're almost right. What's the thought? What's going on here? This is about. This is about the inner ear. People. People who are deaf, or people always trying to find out how to improve deaf people's hearing. <coughs> Um, trying to make them able to hear better. They try to help, but they even enter into the deep ear to try to fix it. Right. <laughs> this is correct. Very good. You got the point. Hit the nail on the head. And finally, it's a comparison um, between the ear and the cave. Right? You go down into a cave, and the tube goes down into the ear. And you know, um, the, the different lines that go down to the ear compared to stalactite or the cave. And what's the thing pulled off? Things being pulled out. But you know what they do? They clean out the ear. What's being pulled out? What's being pulled out? Cilia. Right. And they're implanting a cochlear implant into the ear, placing it deep down inside. And you have just a question. If this, your perception of this is positive or negative, you're saying it's negative. Wow, well, you're right. You couldn't catch it, but you're right. I'm not overt about my impressions of this. I love ambiguities. And I want you to have to work hard to figure out what it is that I really, what it is, what the real point is. Um, I'd just like to talk, to give you a, 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 a picture, an image, as I did with Snowflake. And I had to do with the cave and let you then figure out what my perceptive perceptions are on these images. We have the cave, and then we have these steps, you know, stairs going deeper and deeper down to the cave. What do these stairs symbolize? It's the um, the lines from the cochlear implant. Oh, it's the lines uh, from the cochlear implant, and then these lights. What do they symbolize? The electricity, right? The energy, the electricity that's being wired down into the ear. And these drips and the lights. What's that? It's like air conditioning placed within a cave. <laughs> Meaning that really um, <coughs> the natural elements of the ear are taken out and these artificial elements are placed in. And it's very ironic. You notice the, um, the ribbons that I set up and the lights. And the chairs, red, white, and blue, um, placed throughout the audience, symbolizing the American flag. Now, why would I do something like that? Why did I bring up the American flag? Because the government supports it, right? Because this is during the time of the hippies when they used bright colors and tie dyes and all that kind of thing. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> And what I'm also talking about money here. You know, the cochlear in, implants cost millions of dollars. It's very expensive. You're putting a lot of money into a kid when you do that. So I'm sure that the uh, tech, technologists, the people who are using this, only have um, see, see dollar signs in front of their eyes when they think of placing cochlear implants. Now, what's all this about? This brightness up in the sky. It's about the sound about misperceptions, <coughs> very good, about anger. There's many different interpretations, but my interpretations are that this is, these are the sounds that I can't hear. And a cochlear implant um, just makes those sounds increase in volume. So if you make your airplane now in increase <laughs> amplitude. So what benefit is that? Okay, now I'll perform it again, all right? And this is the last and final point.
children now, and there's more and more um, news about, about children getting um, inappropriate implants. So I really want to talk to you. I really want to make a message about that. Thank you for listening to my message. Take care. I want to thank the interpreter for uh, interpreting for Clayton Valley tonight. Susan Chapel is on to use her voice. And we have a tiny interview tonight. I don't want to be back after that.